I'm here to talk about action, about turning ideas into deeds, about fighting back. Specifically, I'm here to talk about conquering the threat of woke capitalism. I'm here to talk about winning. All of us have encountered heavy-handed wokeness in one form or another. In our schools and in our workplaces, usually this comes out under the banner of uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, or critical race theory. These are the language police, right? The folks pumping poisonous gender ideology into our classrooms. These are certainly huge problems, but the bad news is it's just the tip of the proverbial iceberg. It is the cultural manifestation of a larger revolutionary attempt to remake the American economy in ways that would destroy our way of life. The material foundation of the revolution lies in a complex and destructive scheme that aims to fundamentally alter the American energy sector. In short, the left wants to hijack massive amounts of capital to destroy the fossil fuel industries on which American manufacturing and American sovereignty depend. The good news is, is that this attempt can be beaten. And if we win the fight for American energy, the material basis of the left's new cultural revolution will fail. My state, the great state of West Virginia, uh, is, hey, one West Virginian out here, all right, uh, is leading the charge to reverse this destructive campaign against our greatest resources. Today, I will explain how Appalachia is beating the corporate oligarchs of Wall Street. So unlike previous revolutions, the new cultural uh, revolution is now, it's not playing out in the streets, at the barricades, or at a ballot box, far from it. Instead, it is playing out in our corporate C-suites, universities, state pension boards, and drab government offices. In these rooms, corporate executives and managers and bureaucrats quietly advance a new set of rules aiming to redefine capitalism and put it into the service of the left. These rules are called ESG. Now, I know we've heard about it a little bit, but what is ESG, environment, social, and governance-based investing, is a combination of regulatory, anti-competitive, cultural, and social maneuvers aimed at making the free market unfree. It is an unholy merger of left-wing cultural and corporate economic power that seeks to destroy the American fossil fuel industry by starving it of access to capital. In this way, ESG aims to revolutionize the American economy without a single vote cast in favor of it. It seeks, in other words, to reshape our society outside of the political process. I want to emphasize that real quick. ESG is self-consciously an effort to circumvent the political and legal accountability. That is what Larry Fink, my best friend, CEO of BlackRock, means when he says that capitalism has the power to shape society. As most of us know, that's clearly true. In decades past, capitalism helped raise millions out of poverty. It's built a thriving American economy. It made us the richest nation on earth. But Fink isn't expounding upon the productive uh, potential of the American economy, far from it. He isn't talking about maximizing the returns for his investors. Instead, he is saying that those with lots of money and BlackRock, the world's largest asset manager with nearly $10 trillion assets under management, an astounding amount of capital, can shape society through the application of financial leverage to non-financial goals. They can put aside their fiduciary obligations for, to their shareholders and weaponize shareholder money to force cultural, regulatory, and social change. This marks a major shift from the social responsive, uh, socially responsible investing ethos of yesteryear. Some of you all might remember that. Socially responsible investing uh, explicitly sacrificed profits to drive social change. As a result, it wasn't very effective. Um, for obvious reasons. <laughs> Dollars actually end up following returns instead of ideas. And so it didn't capture the market and failed to advance the left's agenda. That's how ESG was born. ESG emerged out of this failure of socially responsible investing. Instead of asking market participants to invest in their causes, major market actors now seek to force investment 
for their utopian projects. This new coercive capitalism has worked. Every publicly traded company has an ESG score. The big three asset managers have adopted and, aggressive and are aggressively pushing ESG. Every major rating agency, such as S&P Global, hands out ESG scores now to every state and municipality in the country. All major banks have adopted ESG policy frameworks, and the federal government is pushing to encode ESG policies through the SEC and the U.S. Treasury Department. Even in the face of an energy crisis of their own creating, liberal elites and the managerial class of the financial sector remain committed to supplanting American energy independence with unreliable, inconsistent, non-exportable green energy, most of which is manufactured in China. And let me be clear, this is an energy crisis that they created by diverting investment away from critical industries, creating artificial scarcity in the market as renewable energies fail to provide the power generation capacity required to sustain modern society. So the silent revolution has taken place right under our noses. And the worst part is we are all funding it. If you have a 401k pension plan, you're part of this. You are all funding it. We all are. It's in our university endowments. They're using your money to achieve their objectives, objectives that would destroy you. So what is to be done? I suspect most of us don't want the same shape of society that Larry Fink does. And I can assure you West Virginia does not, and I believe most Americans do not. But those of us in this room don't have billions and trillions of dollars at ready at hand we have our votes. But what if those votes don't matter in the, faces, in the face of massive combinations of institutional wealth? Do we still live in a constitutional republic? Or are we living in a country controlled by a cartel of corporate oligarchs that get to decide the very moral, social, and policy questions of our country without any accountability whatsoever? So I'm now going to talk about what we did here in West Virginia. So when I came into office, I was somewhat familiar with ESG, but largely ignorant to how pervasive it had become. So immediately after being sworn into office in January, I began to hear from coal companies and uh, gas companies. These firms were hearing from their lenders who were signaling that the fossil fuel companies were about to lose access to capital necessary to finance their operations. When they asked why, the banks pointed to a more aggressive line being pushed by the Biden administration's net zero IQ climate czar, John Kerry. Um, I immediately started to dig into this issue. You have to understand in West Virginia, we had lived through Obama's war on coal, during which time West Virginia lost tens of thousands, tens of thousands, let me repeat that, direct and indirect coal mining jobs. And so I understood the urgency. After multiple conversations with energy producers, the financial sector, and other state treasurers from around the country had heard similar stories, I decided to act. And so last May, I organized a coalition of 15 state treasurers from around the country to join me in a letter. We warned Wall Street and the Biden administration that if they continued to impose ESG through extra legal means, there would be consequences from our respective states. We gave them fair warning. We had no response. I suspect John Kerry and the rest of that crew were assuming that we were grandstanding. Then after extensive fact finding and deliberation, last November I followed up with my first action. In a second letter sent to the world's largest financial institutions, our coalition let them know collectively we would be reforming our internal contracting procedures for our banking contracts. Some states adopted new certification requirements, others adopted new due diligence, but at the end of the day, we were going to stop doing business with banks that are boycotting the fossil fuel industry. And because collectively we control $600 billion assets under management, we thought we would get their attention. Again, we didn't hear anything. They thought we were grandstanding, but we weren't. So my next action came in January, and that certainly got their attention. This January, I was the first state in this country to drop BlackRock 
as an investment option for the state treasury funds in my state of West Virginia. Thank you. BlackRock uh, had the contract for our liquidity fund. It was an inflow and outflow of about one and a half billion dollars. Using my authority, I terminated that contract. We made clear that the only BlackRock that we like in West Virginia is beautiful, clean coal. <laughs> so Arkansas ended up following suit. Then we had Texas now just recently drop BlackRock from their pension fund. These are huge movements of capital. We're talking about billions of dollars and Wall Street finally noticed. At the same time, I went to the legislature and requested additional statutory authority to create a restricted financial institution list. The legislation would give me the authority to review and to determine if any financial institution is boycotting the fossil fuel industry, namely a prohibition on lending to coal, gas, and oil, and place them on a list that would bar them from all state contracts until they drop their boycott. Any bank found to be boycotting the fossil fuel industry would be given 30-day notice and a right to appeal. Now, it's important to highlight here my legal reasoning behind this action. First, there's a clear conflict of interest when banks that practice ESG handle our tax dollars. West Virginia's economy depends heavily on the fossil fuel industry. Severance taxes generate hundreds of millions of dollars for my state. Any bank handling dollars generated from the fossil fuel industry while at the same time trying to diminish those dollars through ESG aimed at destroying the fossil fuel industry has a clear conflict of interest. I have a fiduciary duty to act in the best interest of my taxpayers and walking into a conflict of interest violates that duty. Second, I am not a market regulator. I'm a market participant. I'm a consumer. I am just stating our preferences in the marketplace on behalf of my constituents, the taxpayers of West Virginia. We are not going to pay for our own destruction. If you want to do business with us, here's what we expect. We aren't going to allow them to weaponize the money, uh, we're not going to allow them to weaponize money created by the very industries and people that they seek to destroy. So this is a free market solution. I want to be clear on that. Pushing the bill through the legislature, though, I will tell you, was no walk in the park. I had the Bankers Association come out in opposition to me. There were op-eds written all over the place saying that I'm, in, I'm interfering in the marketplace. And I had big banks coming into town and trying to pressure legislators and community bankers to try to get me to back down. Now, this just ended up hardening my resolve to persevere. And I will tell you one of the most disappointing aspects of this, one of my largest critics was uh, people from my own party, actually, establishment Republicans that felt that I was interfering in the marketplace. But we didn't back down. We listened to genuine concerns, ignored the noise, and kept fighting, and the bill passed with bipartisan support. Thank you. So in June, my office sent six letters to financial institutions authorized to do business with us. These six institutions had been found to be boycotting the fossil fuel industry. In many cases, by their own admission, they had prohibitions on lending to coal industry, restrictions on oil explora exploration, and arbitrary restrictions on natural gas pipeline construction. Every one of the six of them, they appealed. Two months ago, I am happy to say, we placed BlackRock, J.P. Morgan Chase, Wells Fargo, Goldman Sachs, and Morgan Stanley on the restricted financial institutions list. Their contracts have been terminated and their authority to bid on new contracts has been revoked in West Virginia. Now, West Virginia, like every other state, we contract out all of our, all of our financial services to the private sector. As state treasurer, I have the sole authority for banking contracts in the state of West Virginia, from DMV to the university system, Department of Health and Human Resources. Just in West Virginia, we're talking about billions of dollars of contracts. These five financial institutions have lost access to those dollars now. Now notice, I sent six letters, but I listed five. And here's where it gets interesting. U.S. Bank, the fifth largest bank assets under management in the country, 
actually reversed their policy and lifted their prohibition on lending to the fossil fuel industry. That is how we win. <laughs> Folks, this is how we win. We leverage our capital. We fought and we won on this. And now they got to keep their contract with us. It's a pretty nice one. It's ACH contract does $20 billion a year in uh, transactions for us. But guess what? Good news for U.S. Bank. They went on to win contracts in South Carolina now and Missouri, and they're pretty popular uh, amongst the states. We're talking about billions of dollars. And I've received a flood of proposals and um, uh, from various different financial institutions from around the country looking to capitalize on opportunity where these woke banks don't want to do business with us anymore. So I understand for some folks that this might make them uncomfortable, many of us naturally suspicious of government intervention, but acting within the law, we cannot be afraid to use executive power on behalf of our people and their interests. We cannot. We are given power by the people, and we must use it when appropriate to defend their livelihoods and their futures. We cannot be afraid to flex the muscles that we have. And as I've said earlier, I'm not a market regulator, I'm a market participant, and I'm not the distortion in the market. It's these woke banks and corporations that are the distortion. Now look, if these Wall Street corporate elites want to keep playing stupid games, well, guess what? They can keep winning stupid prizes and they can go explain that to their shareholders for all I care. Texas has just re released their restricted financial institution list. Kentucky, Oklahoma, and Tennessee have also passed similar legislation. As I have talked to states all over the country, we're likely to have as many as 12 other states run this exact same type of bill. This is a movement that's going on here. And right here in Florida, Governor DeSantis has taken, ba taken back the uh, voting rights on his pension fund that was infiltrated with ESG, just like it is all over the country. Now, to be clear, there's no silver bullet here. Every state constitution is different, and beyond state offices, we need a multi-pronged approach to be able to defeat ESG. Federal legislation is being developed, and reforming uh, proxy voting is also certainly something that's in order. But we do need more restricted financial institutions lists. Other organizations are exploring antitrust laws like the AGs, which is very, very important. And there's new asset managers. We've heard from a couple of them, Strive and Second Vote Advisors. The market is speaking, right? But look, there's one thing that's very, very clear here, very clear. And it's money talks and bullshit walks, okay? And if we're going to continue to move, if we're going to continue to win, we have to move capital. That's how we're going to win. Now, thank you very much. Now, before I conclude, I, I do just want to take a brief detour and go into my background a little bit to explain why I feel so passionately about these issues. Um, I actually started, um, how I started my career has really shaped my public service. Uh, not many people know this, but I actually be, uh, began my career as a welder after I graduated from trade school. My first job was actually working in a mining operation, uh, doing maintenance on mining equipment. And I went on to do some steel structural where I was hanging I-beams and uh, went on to become a welder and doing some defense contracting work, making pretty cool stuff. 50 cal like machine gun turrets and stuff like that. But I, I ended up welding my way through college and uh, getting an internship on the Hill. And this led to various staff jobs on the Hill. And I ended up working in a corporate role at one point at Textron, parent company, Bell Helicopter. But that's actually not what's important here. What is is that I learned more about the American people in my various welding jobs than I ever did through my experience working on Capitol Hill or in any boardroom for that matter. This, you have to understand about me, is who I am at my core. It's what grounds me in my work. It's the lens through which I've formed my views over the years. I am motivated by practical experience first and foremost, not abstractions. I prefer my conservatism concrete, not hypothetical. So you got to understand, coming from that background as a blue-collar worker, these are my people. 
the working people of my state and this country. This is who I am fighting for and against the, corporate, uh, the woke corporate elites that seek to suppress and subjugate them. They matter in this country. They absolutely matter. Now, whether you believe the climate is changing or not, um, appears to be very hot today. I'm sure at some point it won't be. Uh, there's one thing that is changing for sure, and that is the outcomes of the average Americans due to the measures being taken to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions around the world. This is a rich man's problem. It's a solution in search of a problem. It's missing the real crisis in American life and that's the failure of Ameri a, 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 a failure of human flourishing. Meanwhile, back home in West Virginia, our life expectancy rate has dropped. Our workforce participation rate continues to flag as our opioid over overdose numbers are unconscionably high. We have record-breaking percentage of children in foster and kinship care. These policies are literally killing us in West Virginia. I mean, we're fighting for our lives and our futures. Now, look, the war on West Virginia and the working class of this country is nothing new. It didn't start with Biden and it didn't start with Obama. It wasn't even pushed by Democrats. Both parties have contributed to it through uncritical bipartisan support of globalization. Globalization in West Virginia destroyed our manufacturing, our steel mills, and our small towns. You know, we were told places like Walmart would make our lives better with cheap goods and services. Well, guess what? It ended up gutting our small towns and destroying our small businesses. Now, these same types of globalists want to come take our jobs in a place like southern West Virginia. So what are we left with? Working at Walmart, I mean, my God, this is not living. This is not what's supposed to happen in this country, right? I mean, it's not right. And just recently, we had a Walmart close in Logan County, West Virginia. I mean, have you ever heard of something like this? I mean, like, what the hell is going on here? I mean, do we still live in the United States of America? My God, I mean, I'm, and I'm sorry to get so emotional about this, but y'all come to Southern West Virginia and you've seen what I've seen, it, it'll break your heart. I'm telling you. And this is, um, this is the cost of the new cultural revolution. They're content to have us living in a kind of modern serfdom while hostile foreign powers like China pick over the carcasses of our great manufacturing bases like vultures in an industrial desert. The good news is, though, that I believe our crumbling monuments to a once unrivaled manufacturing base, once the envy of the world, can be revitalized. The foundational stones are still there, and that's American energy. Doubling down on fossil fuels will bring back jobs back home with cheap, reliable energy, bring them back from China. It will give us back our energy sovereignty, which is critical to our security. So in closing, let me ask, as, and many have asked this as conservatives, what are we trying to conserve? Now, that is a question we all need to be able to answer. I think we absolutely do. For my people in West Virginia, not only am I trying to conserve our livelihoods, our economy, and our way of life, it's deeper than that. You have to understand this. It's deeper than that. It's our inheritance. It is our inheritance. Our inheritance that was paid by our forefathers who settled West Virginia, who have toiled over and under the ground for generations. From the mountaineer to the coal miner, it's our generational struggle that we had in West Virginia for fair wages for coal miners. We literally fought wars over it literally fought wars. They were called the mine wars. People lost their lives, shot and killed during this time period. Now today, the average coal miner is nearly making $90,000 a year. That goes a long way in West Virginia. 
But you know, the sad thing is, they want us to throw all that away. Our culture, our inheritance, our labor, and our future. And I can promise you this. There is no way in hell I'm going to let that happen as long as I'm state treasurer of West Virginia. Um, so I just want to say thank you all so much. I'll see you all out on the battlefield, and God bless.